Hello. 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 Hi. Good morning. This is a big crew. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Has anyone been through this meeting before? First time here as well. <laughs> Just on YouTube. Got it. Oh, that's good. So you've got some sense of what's going on. That's cool. Well, I, I think I watched the video. Got it. For the introduction piece or for the uh, 101 itself? Um, I, goodness, I think it was for the 101 maybe. Okay. There's so many links. There are many links. <laughs> Which one's mine? Uh, I, uh, my name is Matt Donovan. I am a legal intern, um, and I actually have class at one. So I can uh, stay for the introductions and part of the CEO 101, but I think I might have to dip out early. Okay. Yeah, I've got a hard sub too, so I'm not sure how we'll play that. So is, is this session owned by somebody, or is it just an opportunity for us? I, I guess is everybody here new since the last sounded one like of it. These sessions? Okay, so it's just an opportunity for for each of us, I guess, to introduce ourselves before Sid joined the call. Is that right? Uh, that's, that's what it looked like. What I understood, yeah. Self organize. Well, I think there should be someone from the people ops team, but I think uh, I'm guessing that it's mostly. I think Chloe is supposed to hop on. Uh, All right. Or she was the organizer, so. Okay operating under that assumption? I saw her doing some things a few minutes ago. Oh, in the sense of not sitting around, I'm going to introduce myself real quick. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm Walter Zavaglio. Uh, I started as Director of Business Operations at GitLab, um, I want to say three weeks ago, uh, but uh, the second week was in South Africa, so I'm actually super turned around for exactly how long I've worked here. Uh, but it's been a good start so far. Um, a super popular question at the summit was like, what does business operations even mean anyway? If you're sitting there asking that to yourself, feel free to just ping me on Slack. Happy to chat a little bit about the role, how I fit in, and kind of what, what I see as some of our needs. Hi everyone, uh, I'll just continue. So uh, my name is Peter and I'm based in Budapest and I'm doing a sales, inside sales, so uh, SDR role. And I started on the 1st of August. So actually I've been around and also been to the summit and uh, it was great. So uh, I think I also have seen some of you, at least faces I, I can recognize. Um, so I, I'm gonna be working in the German uh, region uh, mainly. Uh, so Germany, Austria, Switzerland, but general EMEA uh, inside sales role. Cool. And I actually just found directions for this meeting uh, on, on the invite or in the link. So we're supposed to go in the order on the calendar invite and answer what do we do at GitLab, why we joined, and what we enjoy in our private life, as well as some things about the coffee breaks, if you've seen those on your onboarding ticket. So I'll start. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, name is Mark Robinson. I'm the federal channel manager. Yes, I'm dressed up for the meeting because I'm at a conference, government conference today with my peers and learning uh, the wonderful sales spiel of the GitLab values and uh, there is a tremendous uh, demand in our space. Um, so very excited to engage our partners. Uh, real quickly, what do I do? I do fun, um, big foodie, love to drink wine, uh, enjoy costume parties like we did in South Africa, <laughs> Gillis as well. Um, but very excited by this new uh, culture of transparency and eager to engage with Sid. There you go. I can go next. I'm Melissa Farber. I'm based in um, Austin, Texas. Currently, I'm in Philly um, for a few weeks. Um, prior to joining GitLab, I was uh, in the healthcare space, and then before that, at a company called The Knot, the a wedding industry. Um, I am on the security team and focused on compliance to uh, help uh, get us uh, prepared for um, potential our, our IPO. Um, so internal controls uh, help support HIPAA, GDPR, um, PCI, that type of thing. Um, I like to bike ride, mystery novels, and I do enjoy red wine. 
So very excited to be here. Echo the thoughts of um, uh, GitLabbers that uh, really uh, look forward uh, in embracing the transparency. So, and to working with all of you. Okay, I can go next. I am Caroline, I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. I will be joining the support team. I will be doing services support in uh, EMEA region. So I'm one of the people that the customers will be encountering first when they, they seek to interact with GitHub. Um, in my spare time, if I'm not in the airport waiting to hop on the next plane, I am reading or I'm swimming or I am just listening to music. I am the kind of person who is disturbing the neighbors with very loud music. Sorry, neighbors. Um, also, I'm really excited to be at GitLab for the entire, the handbook, the handbook is a first. I will say that again and again. It, it caught me very off guard to have to prepare. It felt like you're preparing for an interview with insider information, you know? It's not like other companies that expect you to prepare for an interview and you know nothing about the company apart from what they put on their website. So that was really a first for me and very interesting. So I'm excited to, to work with you all and uh, yeah, this is, today is my first day actually. So we are starting on a high note. So let's see how this go. Thank you. All right. I think I'll take it from there then. Uh, thanks, Caroline, and welcome to GitLab. Um, all right. So I joined recently, not as, uh, not as recently, uh, just before the summit. So it's been a week and, uh, and a bit for me. Uh, my name is David Planella, uh, and I'll be joining or I've joined as the Director of Community Relations. Uh, so that means that my, uh, my team and I will be um, working hard to make sure that um, more and more contributors um, start making uh, GitLab even more awesome. Um, and uh, working across uh, different uh, areas of contributions, meaning people contributing code, people uh, doing evangelism, as in organizing meetups, uh, speaking about, uh, about GitLab, um, and uh, essentially making sure that uh, our values and, uh, and GitLab itself as a, as a product is, uh, is well known. Um, the, one of the reasons I joined GitLab was uh, essentially I come from a background where uh, transparency was also key. I used to work at um, Canonical, the makers of Ubuntu. For those of you who are familiar with uh, with open source, I used to manage the community team in there. And for me, it was uh, it was essentially a, a great fit because uh, not only I identify with these values of openness and, um, and working transparently with the community, but this is also something that uh, that I really enjoy and where I think I, I can I can try. Um, other than that, uh, what I do uh, outside of GitLab or when I'm not at my computer, um, I've been a Lindy Hop dancer for uh, many years. Uh, Lindy Hop is a dance, uh, well, based on, well, if you're familiar with Swing, uh, with the next location of the, of the summit uh, as well. Um, it's a dance that was um, dancing the, from the 20s to the 40s uh, in the US and uh, in the 80s had a revival and um, all across the world is very, it's become very, very popular. Other than that, um, I do traditional woodworking um, as well, um, building things with, uh, with my hands. Um, I do enjoy swimming as well and uh, rock climbing. Thanks, David. Um, I take it from here. Um, I'm Peter. I'm located in Bochum, Germany. I, um, this is my second day at GitLab as a senior backend engineer in the monitoring team. Uh, I'm very excited and very glad to join GitLab. Um, in uh, my previous company, we've used uh, GitLab for like five years. Um, and um, I liked the software. Um, and uh, after looking uh, looking into the handbook, I was amazed how transparent GitLab is, and I actually I said, okay, let's apply, let's try it, and here I am. Uh, in my spare time, I I play chess and ride bikes. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I'll I'll volunteer to go next. Um, my name is Rachel, and I'm based in London. Um, I'm going to be the engineering. I'm going to be the engineering manager for uh, the Geo team. I was really interested in joining uh, the GEO team specifically because I do have a special interest in disaster recovery, uh, disaster recovery and preparedness and helping teams uh, get through any events like that. Um, uh, yeah, so I was very interested to join. Um, I've also only joined yesterday, so it's uh, early days for me. 
Um, when I'm not at my computer, I very much enjoy doing DIY around the house uh, or taking my dog for long walks down the canal, which is close to where I live. Hi all, my name is Jose Finotto. I'm based in Germany. I work in before in Groupon as an engineering manager, most focused on infrastructure databases. Main reasons I joined GitLab is for the values of the company and the challenge that we have in front here. Uh, what I like to do in my spare time is like watch movies and listen to music. I'll go next. Uh, hi, my name is Seth. I'm uh, based in New York, and I'm the engineering manager for the monitoring team. Before uh, GitLab, I was at New Relic, and there I was the engineering manager for the APM UI team. Um, so it's a space that I'm, I'm familiar with, and I'm really hoping to help uh, build out the team and, and, and build out that, that piece of the, the DevOps um, lifecycle for, for GitLab. Uh, so I joined GitLab for a lot of the same reasons I've, I've heard from, from many of you. I think the, the transparency you know, from the beginning, uh, talking to the recruiter, reading through the handbook, that really struck me. Uh, and then also, I think the, the excitement and the, um, of, of working for a company that does uh, remote so, so fully and, and so well, um, that's something I really wanted to, uh, to, to try out and, and to work on. Um, let's see, I, uh, we recently moved to New York um, from, from Portland, um, Oregon, so on the other side of, of the country. And so we've been spending a lot of time recently getting stuff set up here and exploring the city. Um, I like to, uh, like to watch soccer, uh, I like to play volleyball, um, and spend time with my kids. Um, yeah, that's all. Thanks, Seth. Uh, I guess I'll jump in here if that works. Um, my name is Matt Donovan. Uh, I am starting as the legal intern for you guys here at GitLab. Um, I'm a second year student at the University of Richmond School of Law in Virginia. Uh, it's sort of a really interesting company if you think about it in terms of open source and remote work in terms of legal difficulties. So it's a really um, sort of a, an exciting field to get into. Uh, you know, so I'm excited to work with Jamie. Hopefully we can uh, develop a um, better system where she gets some of the harder ball questions, I get more softball legal questions. Uh, but, um, you know, I don't really have free time in law school, but I used to. Uh, and when it, that was that case, I used to love skiing, mountain biking, and uh, hiking and camping. Okay, um, I'll go next. Hi, I'm Alexander. I live in Hamburg, Germany. Um, <clears throat> um, I joined GitLab. So I discovered GitLab because I was uh, looking for jobs in the in the open source or free software space and then i read uh, parts of the handbook and discovered that it's all remote uh, uh, only and so um, so basically everything about this job is the complete opposite of my previous workplace and i found that very interesting um, i'm i started yesterday as a security engineer for automation and um, yeah really Really looking forward to, to helping the security team uh, do their work without doing uh, a lot of work. And um, here in Hamburg, in my free time, I volunteer in various projects, most of it in a local uh, wireless mesh networking community. Uh, I also help out at a small um, Japanese film festival that's, that's, uh, that happens every year in Hamburg. And um, I regularly go to a board gaming group with several other uh, software developers, uh, also from Hamburg. Yeah. Okay, then I go next. Uh, I'm Dennis, I'm also starting the security team. Um, so I'm a senior uh, security engineer uh, for security research. Um, before joining GitLab, I was working at Ripple, uh, the blockchain startup. And before that, uh, I was uh, doing a PhD at the University of Luxembourg, uh, and I was focusing on automated security testing. Um, why GitLab? Uh, first of all, it's, it's a really interesting company for many of the reasons you already said, uh, like the, the values and the, the handbook, transparency. Um, and also, I think the opportunity is, is really great uh, where I can bring in my experience uh, that I collected so far. Um, yeah, other than that, I'm, I'm living uh, in Luxembourg, uh, native German. And in my free time, I like to climb and also to play board games. 
Awesome. I can go next. Um, my name is Emily Lears. I am um, located in the Bay Area in California, and I am, oh, I've been here for a week. So my first day was, was uh, the first day of the summit. So um, this is kind of my first day of um, normal work, if you will. Um, but I will be, I'm here with the field marketing team. So I'll be the third, um, third person I'll be covering our Western region out here. Um, I come from MongoDB where I also covered, uh, also managed our, um, so super excited to be at GitLab. It's, um, for me, it's a, a great opportunity. I kind of was interested in the quote unquote lifestyle that a remote company allows you to have. Um, I'm a competitive triathlete, so I love to swim, love to bike. Um, I kind of run because I have to, wouldn't say there's any love there, um, but thoroughly enjoy it. I uh, really enjoy meeting everybody from um, who was able to make it to the summit and excited to get to know everybody else. Okay, I'll jump in here. Um, so I'm Liam, I'm the new engineering manager for the Manage team. Uh, Manage, I think, is one of the two new teams that spawned out of the platform team. Um, and it will allow us to have more of a focus on the administration, user settings, that kind of thing um, around GitLab. And I think the product manager, Jeremy, has come up with a slogan that we're trying to turn GitLab um, admins into superheroes. So no small task there, I guess. Um, so I joined GitLab for many of the reasons that have been discussed already. It looks like a really exciting um, project to be part of. Um, when I'm not working, I'm a big sports fan, usually watching these days more than playing or being involved. Um, I have two daughters, a six month old and a two and a half year old. Um, so actually most of my spare time is now taken up by sleeping. Um, and I guess to continue the theme from earlier, I'm also, I uh, also like drinking wine, probably more so now I have two children. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. I can jump oh. in next. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Blair. Uh, uh, my name is Blair. I'm a support engineer for America's West. I started a couple weeks ago, uh, but wasn't able to go to the summit. Um, I joined GitLab kind of uh, to echo what everyone else said, uh, the transparency to the culture, as well as the product um, are all just really exciting to be a part of. Um, I live in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, which is up in the mountains in Colorado. It's a ski resort. Yeah. So I love to ski. I was a ski instructor. I um, love to do that. Uh, we're just praying for snow now. It's starting to get cooler, which is awesome. Um, I also love doing triathlon. I'm a volleyball coach. I um, and just like to play in the mountains. So, yeah. All right. I think Everyone else is gone, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Jeremy. Um, I'm a sales development rep with GitLab. I started probably the day of or the day before the summit. So I didn't get to go out there and meet a lot of you guys, but uh, definitely looking forward to the next one. Um, I, uh, I've been a financial advisor for the last eight years and had my own brokerage. And so um, really had no free time whatsoever. And uh, so I'm really excited to kind of get back to some of the hobbies that I used to have. Um, I like to fly paramotors. Um, I love to cook. Uh, I've been cooking since I was a little kid. My mom and I co-published a cookbook. I uh, actually was able to put, you know, a couple of steaks in the sous vide right before we got, got on this call. So i um, really excited to be working from home and uh, the ability to work remote. Um, I have a daughter and uh, she's on the speech and debate team and last year she got to travel to DC um, and I mean I was stuck working so I'm really excited to be able to travel with her and you know be uh, a bigger part of her life as well. Um, as far as the coffee calls I have done my coffee calls but um, I mean everybody I've met so far at GitLab has been so friendly so nice so helpful and so uh, if anybody wants to chat you know I'm uh, more than happy to jump on a call with you as well. So did everybody get a chance to go speak now? So I, I didn't do everything because I, I was not paying attention to the directions, of course. Um, but again, uh, Director of Business Operations, um, as for the why of it, so I, I came here from Puppet Labs and uh, I got to go from employee 80 to about employee 700 there. And so I, I was very interested in getting back to sort of the, those key scaling days. And I, I think sort of where we are as a company right now, GitLab is a super exciting time to be. Um, and I also, you know, like everyone said, some of the cultural things are, you know, I, I think of them as operational things, 
um, around transparency and, and uh, sort of distributed values to me represent operational challenges that I, I want to sort of see more of and engage more with. Um, and so for me, sort of the, the challenge at, at uh, GitLab is can we scale and how can we scale the way we want to and maintain that control, that autonomy uh, at the individual level that uh, is, is such a part, big part of the reason why everybody right on this call is here. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at for uh, private life. I live in Portland, so I do all sorts of weird Portland stuff. Um, and then I'm super into sort of synthesizers. So I'm hoping to quit smoking and uh, play with the synthesizers instead of that uh, from my house here. Um, I haven't done any of my coffee chats, so I, I might show up on some of your calendars, uh, but I thought that the summit was a pretty good replacement for that. Uh, and that I think I met at least five people, uh, maybe six. That's what I got. Awesome. In the spirit of continuous iteration, I just realized I forgot to mention where I'm based. Um, so I'm based in Cologne and in, uh, in the north of Germany. Uh, CST, uh, CST uh, time zone. Uh, I'm actually not from a native German. I come from uh, a place near Barcelona, I always say, because that's the city where, uh, that most people know. But I've been living in Germany for the last uh, 10 years or so. Cool. And Walter, I, I wanted to, to mention that I, I noticed the Portland flag behind you about halfway through this call. <laughs> so yeah. I, was like, oh. I noticed you left Portland. Why would you do that? Uh, only only because my, my wife is starting a doctoral program here in New York. Okay. That's about the only excuse. There's not a school yeah. in Oregon, I don't think. Yeah, so if there's a second round, I'll go as well uh, about, I also forgot to mention my interests. So I also love biking. So I noticed quite a few of you uh, said that. And Emily, I see you have even one hanging down from the ceiling. <laughs> Mine are parked outside. There is no room for them here, but. Uh, this is, I have one, I have one we have three of them. One. Sorry, you have three of them as well. Okay. Yeah, they kind of, we put them in various places. <laughs> Right. And are there, are they all like, uh, you know, thin tire race kind of bikes or? They are. So I have uh, two road bikes and one tri bike. Um, so yeah, I would love right. to get into mountain biking. I, um, my first triathlon I did on a mountain bike and couldn't understand why I was slower than everybody else. And, and then I got into a road bike and I understood that it was much easier to do it that way. But yeah, yeah. it's the whole geometry and the, and the tires and kind of tires. And I actually also have a, not to bore you guys, it just it's a mountain bike with a double suspension, which I use on weekends. I don't even have a lock for it because already three of my bikes got stolen in the last four or five years. Uh, so now I have a city bike, which I use for everyday commute. I have two locks now, which is worth half of the bike. They say that it should be 10%, <laughs> but I, I don't want to fool around. And uh, I have a third one, which is an older one. So uh, yeah, and I'm based in Budapest, if I didn't mention it, I'm not sure. Maybe I can ask a question to Matthew. He said he's a student. What are you doing and where are you studying? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I am a law student, so I'm studying a law in the University of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and uh, my focus has been mostly on compliance. Uh, but this year I'm taking on about two or three projects I'm really excited about. Um, we're working uh, with the Olympics to combat corruption when they go into host countries, uh, which is a project I'm really excited about. We're going to go to Paris to see how they're going to combat that. Um, I'm working with uh, the government in Bhutan. They just are implemented a uh, first law school and it's, uh, they have a mandatory anti-corruption program. And then I'm working with a professor on um, the effects of private policing, which is basically uh, what happens when security guards make arrests and if they're authorized to do so. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be a great opportunity to see how that plays into open source. <laughs> The Olympics is going to be a no small feat. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. We've got, a, we've got a pretty big team on it. Yeah. So I'm excited about it, though. Yeah. So corruption in the Olympics is it's a it's a, it's a very rampant problem. Yeah, it is absolutely. But um, you know, there's a for the first time ever, the uh, the Olympics have instituted anti-corruption measures for host countries. Um, whether or not those are going to have any actual enforceability is going to be the main question. 
Interesting, because we have one of the best Olympic teams here in Kenya. We always finish top five because of our runners. And something funny is that the officials are pretty corrupt. You'll find them wearing jerseys and uh, uniforms that were meant to be for the athlete, <laughs> athletes. It's quite funny, it's, and it's a pity. In Kenya, yeah. corruption comes in every department. Anywhere, think about it, we are, we are stealing from there. So to hear a concentration in one of that area will really caught my attention. So yeah. thank you for sharing. No, I'm really excited about it, but it's, it's, you know, it's a bit of a fool's errand to think that one lost student is going to make a difference. So. <laughs> you might. You yeah, might. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see yourself. Yeah. Blair, I noticed you were from Colorado. I'm born and raised in Colorado Springs. Uh, Steamboat's uh, one of my favorite places, man. Oh, uh, yeah. So, uh, I, it's like, it's uh, we're like moose walk through our yard and we had a bear near it. like it's just it's the coolest place but i actually grew up in houston texas um but we always came up here we we're just the texans that came up here so ruined my um, snow for me i get it <laughs> <laughs> but no i love it out here like um this is such a great town so yeah and there's actually another guy who works for gitlab out here matt dorfler who's in sales oh cool um and so yeah which i thought was awesome there's a lot in denver obviously but um, up in the mountains is sort of rare. To, to see. Sounds like a great mountain jog. Get some skiing in for sure, right? Oh yeah. Well, I will, I live like ten minutes walk from the mountain, <laughs> so I'm definitely planning to get some like <laughs> sessions. Hit that, hit that hundred day mark sort of thing. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. How many yeah. how many days you got on your back? <laughs> <laughs> not that. Not not even close. Not even close. Not even close. Yeah. yeah. No, but uh, no, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get an AT this year, so that's what I'm gonna buy. Uh, Solomon's coming out with a really nice binding that's a lot safer for AT. Um, and for everyone who doesn't know, AT is alpine touring. It's when you can uh, hike up the mountain on your skis and then ski down. So you could go to like a national forest or um, a lot of people in the spring here do 14ers and they ski down bases of them. So um, it's like ski mountaineering. Uh, so I'm excited for that. <laughs> be fun. You live in uh, Colorado Springs? I live in Steamboat Springs, which is northwest Colorado, more up in the mountains. I, um, went to, uh, I, I spent I, some time at the Broadmoor Resort in Colorado um, Springs, and that's what made me want to move out there. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Colorado Springs. It's, it's a really cool spot, but, you know, Broadmoor is a, Broadmoor's a step above, man. I'll give you that. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like the pinnacle. It's like the best exactly. <laughs> in Colorado. Yeah. Exactly. We're actually looking at making an exit from the Bay Area to potentially Colorado. We're looking at a couple different states. So Montana, um, Utah, Colorado. So I might come visit you guys at some point. <laughs> if you ever want to come visit, give me a shout. I'll see you're a triathlete. So I'll, we'll take you on a road ride. So, or something. Yeah, yeah, Colorado <laughs> is, is, is a natural choice for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, like Boulder is like tri-central, like with the Boulder res and stuff. Like that, all the tries. In it. <laughs> My coach is from Boulder and he's like, I'm trying to get back there. And I was like, you just tell me when and I'll follow you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard. I lived out in Broomfield because I was working in Boulder. And it's just like, it's tough because everyone wants to live there. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's beautiful. I mean, there's a reason why everybody's going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I like it up in the mountains better just cause I like to ski. So it's easier in the winter if you just live up here. Cause again, yeah. like I can just walk to go ski, which is awesome. Which is and, way easier. Yeah. Yeah. And like, we have really like all the County roads out here are just great for road rides. Um, I mean a lot of climbing, but that's good. Cause like you it's just, good stuff. Yeah. Cyclists. but, um, uh, I feel like a lot of people bike out here and um and if you ever wanted to get into mountain biking like the mountain biking trails out here are like top notch yeah. so yeah for sure <laughs> they're rowdy some of them <laughs> i think we should have sid here in a second maybe Oh, but another so I'm I coach the seventh grade team at the middle school here for volleyball, and it's their first game today. So fingers crossed. Good luck. <laughs> Some of them, I think it's their first time playing a volleyball game, so it should be good time. The best. <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs>
So I think we have Sid now. There he is. Thank you. Oh, I can't record. The host needs to give permission. Who is the meeting host? Oh, we're recording already. That's great. Welcome to um, CEO 101. And this uh, call is to answer questions that you have, stuff we might have missed, stuff that's unclear. A lot of questions about our values, especially. Who has a question? I do, I can go first, but mine is not, uh, is not uh, about the values. I'm going straight for where I come from. So I was wondering uh, if you have been, if you have seen it in the news somewhere, Kenya, where I, can, I come from, I come from Nairobi, Kenya, was dubbed like the Silicon Valley of Africa. So I was wondering, do you have any Kenyan best clients? I, or if no, are you planning to venture out in this region? And uh, how can I help? Yeah. Cool. Thanks for asking, Caroline. Thanks for asking the first question. Uh, I think it's really ex exciting to see the developments in Nairobi, and uh, I've uh, I seen the hacker spaces there. I've even worked with um, a person there, even before, or maybe during my time at GitLab. I did uh, Africa on Rails, and I, uh, I only had one student that, uh, that showed up, and I, uh, I worked with the person. I, I will not name him because this uh, recording will be public, but uh, he ended up working at, uh, at GitLab and um, um, it was, it was really hard to see like what the level of, of facilities was that this person had. So I ended up uh, sending him money for uh, a laptop and a 3G subscription so he could get online. Um, but for example, his living expenses were, or he, he was living on a hundred dollars a month, which, uh, which is something I can't imagine. Um, in the end, he applied at GitLab. We declined him. He, uh, he learned more. He applied again. He got a job. Uh, he worked for a while. He ended up getting, uh, getting, uh, let go for performance, uh, which was super harsh, uh, for him and, uh, for us, like, well, for us or for me, I, I was involved with this termination. Um, and he, uh, he had a super, super rough time. He got back on his feet. He started a startup. He ended up hiring like over 20 people uh, doing a food delivery startup, which was amazing. And I, uh, I recently uh, exchanged emails with him. Um, but uh, I can see the, the ecosystem there developing. There's, there's, there's kind of venture capital there. And it's a really exciting uh, development, of which uh, to that person I got a close look at. I'm not sure that answers your question. Uh, Ishi, briefly, uh, what I would want to know is, are you, are you trying to target the market? Because now things have changed, like a lot of uh, fintechs are coming up, a lot of software development uh, companies are coming up. So is, are there plans in the long term to target the market? And can I make any contributions? Yeah, um, so targeting the market, uh, if we talk about market, I think about customers. Uh, we don't expect to get any significant revenue from Kenya. Um, I do hope we got a lot of uh, usage um, in general in outside uh, US uh, and EMEA. We got a lot of usage, like uh, Jacob Schatz just visited Brazil and all the hands went up when he asked who knew about GitLab. If we look at India, China, amazing, amazing usage of GitLab. Not a lot of money. Like we're not making a dime in uh, China, which is weird. Lots of piracy going on. Lots of companies that are reluctant to pay. Maybe our price points are off. Uh, we don't invest enough in channel partners. Like lots of reasons why it's not working. I think for Kenya, we're not going to make a dime either. I, I do think how we how we can contribute um, is, is by hiring people, um, offering people a chance to, to join a fast going startup, learn how that is run, uh, how financing works, all these things you get access to if you join GitLab. So how you can help is by recruiting other people, not just for support, but also for other functions at GitLab. If you like it here, spread the word also, spread the word about things you don't like here so that people can kind of self-select and opt in or out. 
speak at a at a conference, write a, write a blog post on our blog, how you experienced the first month, um, what, what was bad, because it's pretty hard to start here all remote. Uh, so write about that too, be, be frank, but, uh, but, but shine, shine a highlight on it. What's, um, GitLab is a pretty unique startup. There's very few companies that grow this fast. And uh, I think it's interesting. And, and we want to hire more people in, in Africa. Uh, I think Kenya is, is one of the places we'll end up hiring a lot of people. So that'd be great. We just hired a recruiter focused speci specifically on Africa. So please, please help us hire more people, especially uh, diverse hires uh, would be great. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for asking. I think I'll go next unless there's anyone else. Um, Sid, we had to, um, I, I, I was at the summit among some other, other in, the, in the call, and um, one of the things that I found quite enlightening is to learn from uh, our advisor, um, Zach. Um, I was wondering if you could give us an overview of uh, the role of the advisors, how many of, uh, how many of uh, there, there are and uh, how are they helping us? I have a feeling what Zach you're talking about, but since there were two advisors named Zach at the oh. summit, maybe it's good to, uh, to disambiguate. Uh, uh, Zach Orlock. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. The, the role of the advisors is to help us and the, the, the most important thing is just pointing out stuff uh, where we make a wrong decision or decisions we need to make that we're overlooking. Um, Zach Erlocker had great advice to our management team is that we were, we were kind of right now our, our kind of executive team is coming together and we're close to getting that kind of filled out. And we were feeling pretty happy about ourselves, still seeing what we need to do, seeing all the hires we need to make. And he was like, well, you should focus on that on the director level, like the people reporting to the executive team. That is going to be your focus. Uh, you should put, put a training program in place for them, uh, et cetera. That, that is now where your scaling will fill. And we're all like, yeah, that makes t total sense, but none of us were focused on it. So that's where advisors come in. I think it, is, it was really fun to have Zach and Zach join uh, the summit so that you could get an outside perspective on GitLab. Uh, we also had two investors join. I think it's it's fun for people in the company to like, hey, how does how does GitLab compare with the rest of the world? Because for many of our people, this is the first kind of like super high growth startup, like more than doubling every year that that they're joining, and it's that is not an intuitive or normal environment, and it, it's kind of nice to get an external perspective how we're doing compared to market or what they're normally saying. And I think Michael McBride's uh, presentation really was great there too. Cool, thanks. Good morning, Sid. This is Mark. Um, how are you doing? Good. Um, uh, how are you? <laughs> great. Um, so I was at the summit, very excited, saw the culture of the people, the uh, just amazing culture there. Um, following along the same line of, of advisors, if you had a choice, and this question may have been asked in the past of you, if you had a choice of two living historical persons or not dead or alive, uh, you would want to have dinner with, who would they be and why? This was also in the New York Times, 50 questions to fall in love together, I think. Uh, I hope that's not your intention because that will be illegal for me. Um, the, um, I, I have a lot of respect for um, Jeff Bezos. And that's not because the company just, uh, became, Amazon just became worth more than a billion dollars, um, a billion, <laughs> a trillion dollars, um, which is crazy amount of money. But um, because they've been able to kind of grow um, businesses that are not just adjacent, but like completely different. Going from retailing stuff yourself to running a marketplace to then running a marketplace and then selling compute. And now they're into like advertising and all their other new initiatives. I think it's amazing. And I think the the long-term bets they take and the patience they have are really an inspiration. And it's an inspiration for us to, to do more, go from 
just source control to every part of the DevOps lifecycle from planning to monitoring. It's also a reason to do very long-term bets like Meltano that will only generate money five, seven years down the road. Um, so that'd be, that'd be a person I, uh, I invite. Uh, hi, Sid. If I can follow up on that. Uh, my name is uh, Peter. I'm uh, SDR, uh, uh, working for EMEA. And I was also at the summit. It was really great. I enjoyed uh, meeting all the people face to face. And uh, it's really true. You can feel it when you had somebody, a 2D, you had with somebody a 2D coffee chat uh, on monitor. And when you meet them in person, you already feel like you know them, uh, which is really crazy. When I, when I read the reviews, I was kind of skeptical. But now I felt it, so it was really great. And I also enjoyed your uh, keynotes. Uh, so um, following up on, my question is actually, uh, where would you like uh, to see GitLab in three to five years uh, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of leveling up from repo management to uh, the complete DevOps cycle and CI, CD? Yeah, so right now we're best in class in source control. And we're best in class in CI. Um, Pretty, we're pretty close to being best in class for planning. Um, I think in three to five years, you know, we'll be a public company. Um, we'll be best in class in all the ops spaces too. So packaging, releasing, configuring, uh, monitoring. Um, I think that's our journey. And we have the market being aware that GitLab is... Uh, a single application for this, that a single application has a lot of emergent benefits, that it's, that it's better, um, and that GitLab becomes synonymous with a well-run engineering organization. That in order to transform your organization to deliver value to customers uh, and users faster, you, you, GitLab is like the logical way to do that. Instead of trying to assemble it yourself, you co-create it with more than 2,000 other people and 100,000 organizations. So that's, that's uh, the wish for GitLab in the, the coming years. Um, related to that, I have a question. Um, so I've also read about, about this long-term vision that um, uh, everybody should be able to contribute to all kinds of media. Um, do you always uh, do you see different kinds of GitLabs uh, being at the end of this, or is it um, more important to keep it as a single application rather than uh, support widely different types of content? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure is the answer. We'll figure it out along the way. Um, there's amazing applications like Envision that make it much easier to do kind of collaboration and version control on design elements. So maybe, maybe you need different things. There's, uh, for example, uh, O'Reilly Media uh, uses GitLab on the back end to write their books. But they made their own front end. Um, so I'm not sure whether it will be a future like that, where there's, there's uh, GitLab on the back, or where there's different variants of GitLab, or where they will be able to integrate more and more into GitLab itself. I'm, I'm very excited, for example, now the client-side evaluation that just shipped for our web IDE, like m we're able to add a lot to GitLab. And for example, for Meltano, for now that's a separate application, but there's a plan in the back of my mind to maybe one day integrate it into GitLab if we can do that without losing the audience. Um, so. We'll see, uh, no, no fixed opinion. It could go either of the way. And the, the nice thing is we know, need to decide now so we can just uh, wait and see for now. We're just adding more and more to GitLab as a product to make it great for everything from pub publishing a static site to making uh, mobile apps and everything, uh, everything else. But yeah, I hope someday uh, GitLab will be used uh, for data science, for AI, for for editing movies and let's see what shape that uh, that takes um, yeah, our mission is everyone can contribute we want to change culture from read only to read write uh, one of our uh, early investors um, is in the is in the movie industry and we were talking like if now if you watch uh, a movie you can't remix it like you just get the binary end result wouldn't it be great if you get the separate camera feeds all the editing information um you you'd, you'd be able to have a lot more power 
so uh, I think I think that's 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 interesting. Thanks. I'd be curious to know a little bit, Sid. Um, so many things are going so well. Where have you seen some unexpected challenges, and what's kind of keeping you up right now? Yeah. Um, look, at this growth, like more than doubling every year, there, there's not, there's not, <laughs> there's not a lot of things going well. I, I think, I think what's going well is that nothing is super broken yet, and that we're hiring really great people into the company, and that they still kind of come on board in time. They, they. In general, they say that they know what uh, what's expected of them. Um, if that's not the case, send your boss a message. Send me a message because that's 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 something that breaks really easily in companies, and and that's that's we want to know ASAP if that happens. Uh, what was really broken was uh, GitLab.com. It wasn't available. It wasn't performant. I think we're making huge strides there. Just today, we turned off the NFS servers. Um, those are the file servers, and the problem was if one of them broke, the whole website broke, which is horrible uh, because it's the cloud, stuff breaks all the time. You should be resistant to that. And uh, moving to GCP, turning those off uh, to NFS service office is huge, huge progress. So we're, we're not there yet, but we're making strides. The website's getting faster. Uh, on a huge merge request, it used to take 80 seconds before you loaded it. Now it's three seconds. Um, I'm seeing all the, the metrics improve. I think what keeps me still up at night is um, uh, some uh, filling out the executive team, um, making sure that's functioning as well as it can. Uh, the, the director level that Zach pointed us at, Zach Locker, is probably something I should be worrying about. Mm. And I think the security of GitLab.com. I think uh, we quadrupled the team. Or no, more than quadruple. We're growing the team this year from two to sixteen people. Kathy is doing an amazing job, uh, but that doesn't. The target on our back is growing at the same rate. Um, so um, there's there's a lot of work to do there. Uh, I think Kathy has got it, and she's doing everything she uh, she can, and and I think we're doing a good job. But there's an element of luck uh, in there, and that's that's a risk. Uh, uh, you 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 want to avoid if possible. So uh, that's something I worry about and I talk with Kathy about, but she's doing amazing. Our, our bounties for in the private program we run for finding an RC in GitLab were raised from like $2,000 to $12,000 now in wow. like about half a year. So we're doing a lot. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. Sid, I, I have a somewhat related question, I guess, to, to the, the, the growth and, and changes that come with that, um, which is, as you look forward to, to you know, uh, continuing to grow the company and especially uh, getting to the point where um, we're IPOing, uh, how do you see, um, what, what challenges do you see with maintaining the values that we have now with, with a company like that, especially, I would say, around transparency um, once, once we're a public company? Yeah. Look, transparency is is something we that's that's not that's very hard, and we'll need to put active time into it every day. Like right now, I'm in a Slack conversation about like, hey, why are our core contributors in all our channels? Are our customers okay with that? And we're like, yeah, they signed an NDA. Is that enough? Can we? Will our customers accept it? I'm not sure, but we're going to try to find out and we're not going to, we're going to challenge all the assumptions that people have about that and, and see, see how far we can go. If we become a public company, any, um, um, any information that uh, might affect our stock price needs to be on a predictable channel. So for example, I just sent a tweet out on my personal email a personal Twitter account about how many CI runners we have on GitLab.com. I think in the future, that'd be something I wouldn't send out personally. I'd, I'd have it send out through the GitLab account just to make sure it's on a predictable channel. Um, lots of companies, what they do is they send out less information. Um, that's not actually the SEC rules. The SEC rules specify it has to be a predictable channel. So we can keep being very open as long as it's a predictable channel that's equally accessible by all the investors. 
So that's something that we're going to push our investor relations people for, that we're going to keep being as open. Uh, well, but that's, that's going to be a challenge. Like the, the, there'll be a lot of pushback because we'll be doing it different than everybody else. Another thing is that, for example, on the team call today, we shared a sales update. Um, if you're a public company, you can only share that with insiders. So we're going to make everyone in the company an insider. Um, maybe it means that like core team members cannot be an insider. Um, not sure. Making everyone in the company an insider is done sometimes, but it's not a regular thing. So those are things where we'll keep pushing and we'll have to kind of challenge our advisors, our lawyers, uh, our analyst relations people, our investor relations people, our PR agencies, and, and state how we're doing things different. Yes, we have a public roadmap. Does that affect your revenue recognition? We're looking into it, probably not. Uh, because we're going from six or five to six to six, et cetera. So we're looking into all these things. I don't think we'll have to go back. And so far, I'm very proud in the company's history, we never walked something back. We're only getting more and more open. Um, not sure we can always keep doing that, but so far so good. And as a public company, we can be open about our financials. So as soon as we got uh, financials that are audited, uh, we will start giving investor calls every quarter, even before we're public, because now we can afford a new level of openness. Um, so really excited about that and the goals get more open, not less. Hi, I have a question that follows on from that. Um, as you've spoken there about transparency, which is one of the values. And I was wondering what you do on a, on a weekly or a monthly basis um, to try and encourage the values down into your direct reports and further than that. Yeah, um, thanks Rachel. Great question. Look, I'm trying to lead by example, try to put things in like the Slack CEO channel, put things on Twitter, record my meetings. I think I'm currently very focused on and that goes for everyone and just my reports, but more of our conversations should be public videos on YouTube. This conversation will be, but you're having conversations with colleagues, uh, hopefully in Zoom lots of the time, where if someone asks a question, you say, hey, let's hop on a call, discuss it for 20 minutes. What I want the, the, the instinct of everyone in the company to be is say, hey, let's do it on Zoom, let's hit the record button. And after 20 minutes, we say, look, we, we took care to avoid mentioning any customer names. There's, there's nothing super confidential. We're not quite sure whether this is interesting for the rest of the world, but we don't care. Let's just publish it on YouTube. Um, I hope that will be the case. And I'm gonna make a note that everyone in the company should get a YouTube upload account so that they can publish on our company channel. And I wanna see about a hundred videos a day new on YouTube because one third of our company every workday should have a conversation with a colleague that's uh, that they kind of anticipate that it's going to be interesting for at least uh, one other person. Hi, Sid. Um, so I, I think obviously remote working is a huge thing at GitLab and has contributed to the success of, of the company. Um, I see obviously we maintain a remote only website and on which it states some of the disadvantages is which it might scare off investors and customers and such. I was wondering in the, in the early days of forming the organization, at what point you kind of committed to the decision of being a remote only company? Um, and were there any concerns coming through by Combinator or maybe with, with some of the early shareholders about that way of working? Yeah, thanks. Um, it happened iteratively. Um, as you maybe know, in, or maybe probably didn't notice, but on our values page, it doesn't talk about remote. Remote is not one of our, our values at all. It's an outcome, not, a, not an input. Um, in the beginning, we started remote because it was kind of me and Dimitri and I was in the Netherlands, he was in Ukraine. Then we hired a couple of people in the Netherlands and they came to my office in Utrecht, uh, now a house that you can rent for free. Uh, so make sure you take advantage of that. Um, but those people stopped coming in after a few days. They, they never discussed it. They just stopped showing up, start working from home because that's just how we rolled. By Combinator, they told us, look, you, this makes sense, engineering remote, but it doesn't work for sales and marketing. So 
we said, okay, well, let's, let's, let's do the boring solution, which is one of our values. We'll do sales and marketing on, on site, uh, rented an office, expected to grow out of it in half a year. Uh, but we didn't. We kept it for three years. And then we downsized because what happened is salespeople like Hayden, they showed up for the first two days and then they didn't because it was a one hour commute every every way and they didn't get any value of being in the office. And if you make sure that in the office you don't have extra information, gossip, side chats, if you don't miss out on career opportunities because you're not in the main office, People actually don't like to commute. Um, so the only reason they commute is because they're being, they, they, they think they otherwise miss out. So if you make sure people don't miss out, they'll just stop showing up. Um, that's what happened for a long time. We kept an open mind about it, like maybe this doesn't scale, et cetera. Um, and I think it was only at like 200 people that we said, look, this is, this is scaling a lot better. It's, it's not scaling worse, it's scaling better than uh, co-located places. So that's when we said, okay, we're, we're sure about this. Are there any other companies that um, kind of model their company template or culture after GitLab? And is that something that is on GitLab's radar as far as influ influencing other companies? Um, from time to time, I hear companies that say, hey, we're looking at your handbook a lot and we copied certain sections, which is very welcome. It's, it's creative comments, so people can just copy that. Um, we're also inspired by other companies. Uh, we're looking to up to, for example, WordPress. They pioneered a lot of the remote working. There's other companies kind of doing the same without causality between them. Uh, Zapier, Envision are also running all remote companies and are doing a super good job of that. But over time, I expect more and more companies to kind of be inspired by us also because we document everything we do and, uh, and they can just copy parts of the handbook. And I've known that that happens a lot where people copy one or two pages, send it to their department. I expect future startups that start just copying the whole thing. Uh, Sid, may I have a question about, uh, uh, for example, uh, are there kind of countries, so my question is, where do we grow the fastest? Is it in the Americas, Europe, or is it, uh, is it Asia? And where the fastest growing? Is it, uh, is it manufacturing or is it more finance? So I'm trying to find out because you, as you said in one of your uh, famous pitches is that uh, every company is becoming or is already a software company. Uh, so in which kind of vertical do you see the most growth uh, uh, for GitLab? Yeah, thanks. Um, so growth, we measure it as incremental ACV. And right now that's happening with, you need big companies because big companies buy more. Um, you need companies, we're going the fastest with companies that don't, have not made their own tool set yet. So if, for example, you're, um, let's say a, a company like for example Netflix Netflix is not a customer of us and they, they were one of the first companies that embraced cloud they made a lot of their own tools so they, they even if they wanted to use GitLab we mean deprecating a lot of tools that have like Net, Netflix specific stuff in it it doesn't make sense for them to uh, adopt Netflix however there's for example a lot of financial services firms on the East Coast that don't have a big cloud native tool set yet. And for them, GitLab is a great way to bring this in. Then our usage is a lot bigger outside of the US, but you see the US being, uh, companies in the US being ahead both in, in like adopting DevOps practices and being more willing to pay. And in the end, our yardstick is incremental ACV, like the extra subscription revenue we get. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of growth there. Um, bigger companies in the US making their digital transformation. And we're historically very strong with self-hosted 
companies. So financial services, for example, is, is a great vertical for us. Awesome, thank you. I might have another question, uh, Sid. So I know that you interview a uh, great number of the of uh, potential candidates, if not nearly all of them. Uh, and that they have like, and they have like a wide range of um, of skill sets uh, and also a wide range of uh, of roles. And given that, what's what's your criteria or thought process when uh, well, to decide whether they are a good fit for for the role? Again, given the breadth of uh, skills and uh, and roles. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I stopped interviewing every single hire at uh, when we were 140 people big. Uh, because it just didn't work with my time anymore. Um, I still review every hiring package before it goes out um, because I want to keep a tab on like, are we putting the, the our bar high enough? Are we missing something? Do we have accurate role descriptions for everyone? Uh, are we are we sticking to our compensation calculator? Things like that. So um, keeping tabs on that. Although that's going really well, I, I think I should step out of that anytime. And now. Um, when I review one of the hiring package, I, I have a look at the, the resume of the person. I want to see, hey, do they have like relevant study, relevant company expertise? Um, have they completed some long stints? Like, have they been at a company for two and a half, three years, at least uh, one time in the last three years? Um, do they, is there something? sticking out like some special achievement uh, uh, maybe, maybe a talk they gave uh, maybe an industry certification um, did if there's any flags like did people in the interview process address them like if they stayed at a company for seven months do we know why is that a plausible story um, did people dive into that why do they want to work at GitLab have they dig um, as they progress in the hiring process? Like, have they dig uh, done more homework on the company and the role? We have so many materials. It's okay if people don't do all of it up front, but by the time you're doing your last interview, you should have gotten a bit interested. Um, yeah, are they are they able to get results? Um, have they been successful in previous previous roles? Like. Did they achieve their responsibilities, etc. Um, so those are things I look for. Well, thanks. Hi, Sid. Uh, what's the percentage that we have nowadays on the GitLab.com customers? What's the best what on GitLab.com customers? Uh, the percentage. We have most of them, they have the solution they implemented by themselves. And few of them are, right, understand that it's a smaller percentage on the .com, right? Yep. So for our incremental ACV, GitLab.com is basically one large customer. So it's not contributing a lot to our, our revenue and our subscription growth yet. Um, however, we do feel it's gonna be very important in the future. There's lots of companies that wanna consume it as a software, as a service. So we're responsible for the upgrades. We're responsible for the backups. Um, they get rid of that administrative burden. And so far we've, we've fallen short of, of making it something that is ready for mission critical applications. It's not been as available and, and as performant as people expect. However, I think we've, we're turning the corner there and it's, it's getting better. And I expect, but we'll see, I expect that we'll see as, as people realize that we'll see a, a much faster growth than historically uh, there. Although it's already grown fast, like like it's it's growing exponentially, and uh, uh, that's great. But I think it will pick up um, as as we uh, as the service is better. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing I am wondering about is um, at the current time, 
do more customers uh, choose GitLab for the CI CD part or still mostly for the <clears throat> development and, and uh, repository part? And is that, is that distinction even a thing? I'm asking because uh, until a, a month or two ago, I was mostly aware of the uh, repository and um, collaborating on, on code portion because I mostly used um, other people's self-managed instances. And I was really surprised to learn about the extent of the CSD part. And now in my head, at least there are these two separate aspects to get that. Yeah, for sure. There, and and then we're not even talk about all the all the planning and the security and all the ops capabilities. Um, but you're right. Right now, a lot of people are in a similar situation to you, where they're only aware of the the source code management and the, the create capabilities in our product, and that's not okay. Like we should do a better job talking about all the other aspects of GitLab, and that will take time. But uh, there's there's no time like the present to start start talking about that and we do see when we tell people people are aware and they're, they're picking us for ci for example we had a blog post uh, i published yesterday about how jenkins is splitting up in three different versions of jenkins um, that's a great opportunity for us to say hey gitlab has really great ci capabilities and you can use it with gitlab repositories but it also works great if you're still on github and uh, there are companies, leading companies like Datadog that actually do that. They, they use GitHub for their source code, but GitLab CI uh, to test their software. And uh, we, we built GitLab CI CD for GitHub for that reason. And, and that's starting to get traction. So I think it's, a, it's our second entry point into the market. And as more, of, more and more of these capabilities become best in class, we're going to have many entry points. I foresee a future where people get GitLab just for the security or just for the monitoring. It's going to take us a while to get there, but it's, it's starting to happen. I have a quick follow-up question about that, Sid. Um, do you foresee a time as, as GitLab becomes um, you know, better known for these other capabilities and really fleshes out the rest of product and maybe even you know, future things that, that haven't been conceived of yet, do you foresee a time when uh, the product GitLab outgrows the name GitLab and its association? I think we've already outgrown it. Uh, but I also think Airbnb has outgrown Airbeds and Breakfasts. So I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, a name, it's a variable. We wouldn't pick the same name today, but uh, going through name change is uh, something very distracting. Uh, both for us, but also for all our users who have GitLab running in directories and 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 have software installed with that name. So, I think uh, I think we should just make sure that people think of GitLab as a single application for the whole DevOps lifecycle, from planning to monitoring, and stop thinking about it as a, as a as a Git tool. I can do this all day. Um, we're going to keep going until 20 past, and I especially appreciate questions about our values. I will ask something about iteration. Is it iteration or iteration? Iteration, I think. Yeah, how how well is this being practiced? Because when I read in the hard book about the whole idea, I'd never heard about it as a value before. I was like, this is going to be a challenge. This is going to be something. So I guess my question is, does the team struggle with it? Or is it easy for people to go around it? And what would you advise somebody to make it easy for them to adapt it? Great, Caroline. Thanks. Thanks for that. That's a great question. And 
you started off with questions. This is just your second day, I understood. So uh, thanks, thanks so much. And you hit the nail on the head. Iteration is by far our hardest value to adapt to. Um, sometimes we get new hires and they say, oh, I love iteration. And then we know that they haven't really practiced it because it's very painful and hard. Uh, even I struggle with it uh, regularly where I make too elaborate of a plan and it's possible to to have a smaller first step and I, 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 I catch myself or someone else catches me and says, hey, this is overblown. Iteration is hard because we, we wanna make something beautiful and great and we have a plan and when humans have this unique capability to look out far into the future. And then you have to constrain yourself and say, even though this is the future that we're envisioning now, what is the minimum thing we can ship? And that's frequently something very small, uh, something you're not quite happy with because it's still missing so much, but something that has this quantum of value for your, uh, for your users, or for, for whoever you service. Um, and, and we have to do that. And uh, it's something we don't just do in development, but we also want to practice in all other areas. And uh, I'm not super sure about support, but I can Im imagine frequently you have like, hey, there's miss something missing in the documentation or this, this thing totally needs to be refactored. And then it's, yeah, yeah, it needs to be. But what's, what's the thing you can do now? What's the thing you can do in two minutes? Well, maybe place this a bit higher on the page or add a line here or add a troubleshooting section with one comment. Um, but it's, it's not intuitive. It is uh, painful. Um, in the words of Nat Friedman, uh, future CEO of GitHub, it, it requires a low level of shame uh, that we have to live with because we're not happy. If you go to our website now, you click on products, you'll find four or five empty paragraphs. That's like the main page, the, the leftmost menu item on our website. When you click that, there's empty stuff there. I'm super ashamed of that, but I'm also proud of the team for just pushing that out and allowing us to, to set the, take the next step. Um, and it's, uh, it's the thing I have to train our executives on the most. Like they, they come in and they want to make a three month plan and they, they're starting to work on a big PowerPoint and we have to stop them and say, no, stop working on the plan. Just do <laughs> for everything you're proposing, do the first thing, and we'll talk next week about how that went. Interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see how I adapt to that one, especially. So maybe you could tell me some pointers. I know some things that have made it easier for you over the years, something you have picked along the way. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that question. I, I think it's always like you have a big plan. For example, I, I wrote a big document uh, about our vision where, where GitLab.com should go. And it's uh, it's 30 pages. And I was like, okay, what's now the first step? And I wrote a first step that is a very simple thing we could do in a couple of weeks. Um, and it's it's like that every every single time where you just say, okay, what what can I do? in two minutes, what can I do in an hour? What can I do in a day? Just so figure out a small time constraint. And for you, if you're, you'll frequently be answering tickets, it will be like, okay, this is kind of, I couldn't, this customer, I couldn't point them to the documentation because it's missing there. Instead of like typing the answer there, make a commit to the documentation where you add that answer and I'm send them a link to your commit. It's gonna cost you two minutes more to put it in Git instead of typing it in an email. But now that answer is there for everyone else to see as well. And probably the customer is gonna be way more impressed with you updating the documentation to answer their question. Okay, thank you. Uh, at what point in the company's life were the values uh, created? And did you see them maybe have like a, a real impact on the organization when they when they were yeah they they were created over time um at some point we had 13 of them so we rationalized them a bit because even i couldn't name more than like four of them so we had to make it a bit simpler um i think um the 
biggest impact has come from iteration. And I think that happened during a Y Combinator. Um, there was a, a Y Combinator, they have a two weekly session where you talk about what you did in the last two weeks and what your plans are. And after the second session, I said what we did. And after me was Liz uh, from Campus Job, now called Way Up. And they did so much more. She, she knew her number so much better that after she was done, they said, okay, that's, that's how you do it. And they, they looked at us like, that's how you not do it. And we drove back, me and Dimitri, and we said, look, we got to up our game here. Like, like these, these people are going from no customers to having, a, having done 300 phone calls in two weeks um, with just a single person. Like they were, they were making much faster progress. And we said, okay, from now on, it's going to be like, what can we do in two weeks? And it's amazing how if you need to grow like 20% in two weeks, how that suddenly constrains the problem where you're like, well, we can do this, we can do that. That all takes longer. Like that's not going to have an impact. And then you end up with a couple of things and you say, okay, let's ship it. And uh, um, one person stayed behind in the Netherlands uh, during that time. And he was like, well, what's gone into you? Like, why are we, why are we going so fast and taking so much risk and putting out things that aren't, aren't fully baked? And everyone's like, yeah, this is the new normal. This is how fast we have to go. And it made a, an amazing difference. And then the trick is to keep that speed after you graduate from YC and not let anything stand in the way. So you'll find me, if you look at the CEO page, you'll find like, we have to keep shipping. Like there will be a thousand reasons why you have to stop shipping from GitLab.com performance to customer things to all kinds of reasons, but we'll never, we never will. And that goes for every single department. You, you cannot slow down because after you slow down, it's really hard to get back to that iteration speed because the organization will start applying new quality standards and everything. And it's happened to a lot of good companies that we know and respect for, for, their, for their product, but that have slowed down. Um, so that's, that's our thing. We, we stopped, started shipping during YC in the first month and we'll just never slow down. And I think that's an, uh, that's an appropriate end to this meeting. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions. If there's anything wrong at the company, it's my responsibility. So feel free to, all, to DM me in Slack uh, with any problems you encounter. And, uh, and welcome to GitLab. Thanks for joining. Bye. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.